When you hear the word mercury, what are the first words that appear in your mind? Are they words like dangerous, poisonous, or hazardous? If so, we're not surprised. From a very young age, our parents and school teachers all told us that mercury could be lethal. We know from studying damage that even mercury vapor can cause irreparable damage to the human body. In many countries, including Russia, even the storage of mercury can be subject to criminal penalties. But why are we so afraid of this substance? Today, we're so afraid of mercury that we daren't even touch it. But our ancestors had no such fear of it, either as a liquid or a gas. Some of the civilizations who came before us believed that mercury had magical properties and tried to use it for alchemy. Others believed that mercury was the foundation of all good medicine and attempted to use it to heal rather than to harm. Rather than running away from mercury, whole armies used to sweep into countries for the purpose of capturing it. The whole reason the hordes of Genghis Khan conquered Fergana is that the ancient city was a known producer of mercury and Khan wanted to get his hands on that valuable resource. Pliny the Elder, a noted ancient Roman writer, recorded in his diaries that the Roman Empire fought and bartered with Spain for over a century to secure half a ton of mercury for their own purposes. The phrase, the Philosopher's Stone, will be familiar to any fans of the Harry Potter movie franchise, but the story of the Philosopher's Stone goes back a lot further than that. In times of antiquity, it was thought that the Philosopher's Stone was a magical artifact, capable of converting any base metal into precious gold or silver. Many people believed that the Philosopher's Stone might have been made of mercury. If someone said to you, give me a sea of mercury and I will turn it into gold, you would probably assume they were insane. But those words were once spoken by the famous physicist Sir Isaac Newton. Newton was a firm believer that mercury had special properties that could be exploited with the right study and research, and devoted three whole decades of his life to studying it. Sadly, the full extent of his research is a closely guarded secret, and his records have been lost to time. Taking all of the above into account, it's clear that our ancestors had a very different relationship with mercury than the one we have today. Even as recently as the second half of the last century, mercury was accepted for many different industrial uses. It was even still considered as an ingredient in medicine in some parts of the world. It's only recently that things have changed, and now the mere mention of mercury is enough to make grown adults run away screaming. Let's think about this for a moment though. If mercury is truly as poisonous as people now say it is, why was it mined and fought over for so many centuries? How did our ancestors survive prolonged exposure to it? We know that they worked with it in a very hands-on way, because we've seen so many historical artifacts made from cinnabar. Cinnabar is a red brick form of mercury sulfide and offers the easiest way to extract elemental mercury. To get liquid mercury from cinnabar, all you need to do is heat it in an oven. The minerals will crack open and a steam of liquid mercury will begin to flow out of it. When extracted like this, the mining of mercury is almost completely safe. Only when you combine it with other substances do problems begin to occur. Methyl mercury is a good example. It's one of the most hazardous neurotoxins in the world. The combination of arsenic and mercury is a deadly poison. But arsenic is already deadly on its own. That isn't mercury's fault. Some of the people who have worked with mercury in the past, along with some of those who still do today, are so relaxed about working with mercury that they don't even feel the need to wear protective clothing when doing so. Here, we even see someone put mercury in their mouth without any signs of ill effects. Here's another who shows no fear of submerging their entire hand in liquid mercury. If they're not afraid of mercury, then why is everybody else? Let's look at some of the little known and little explored possibilities of mercury. During the 1980s in the USSR, there were constant rumors that the military was using mercury for the construction of special ultra-powerful radio antennas. A curious and scientifically minded person decided to see if this was possible and built a mercury antenna in their own home. It worked perfectly. 
We can also see in texts from the time that ancient scientists wrote about a strange substance called red lion, which we understand to be a form of red mercury. Some Soviet scientists even believed that red mercury could have the same properties as the Philosopher's Stone. Going back a little further, during the 1960s, it's rumored that Soviet scientists spent millions of dollars attempting to synthesize red mercury in secret laboratories, with the intention of selling it to foreign powers at the price of half a million dollars for each kilogram. Of course, we are now told that none of this ever happened, and that the creation of such a substance would never be possible. Let's put red mercury aside for a moment and go back to discussing plain old silver mercury. How many of you know that mercury could hold the secret of anti-gravity? Mercury interacts in a unique way with magnetic fields, which makes it possible to build mercury engines capable of powering themselves. Exposure to mercury is enough to start an engine spinning. It's thought that much top-secret research has been done on the possibilities of mercury engines, but that research is heavily classified. That doesn't mean all of it has been hidden away, though. During the 1990s, physicist Mikhailovich Polyakov openly conducted anti-gravity experiments with mercury. Polyakov designed something he referred to in his notes as a vortex inertial motor. In essence, his motor created vertical traction against the force of gravity by accelerating channels of mercury vapor in an enclosed space. Using this method, he demonstrated that he could create a limited anti-gravity field, capable of lifting several kilograms of weight into the air. His work should have been an introduction to an era of anti-gravity engineering, but sadly seems to have gone no further. Polyakov's work was exciting, but he was far from the first scientist to notice the potential of mercury to work against gravity. An ancient Indian text was discovered in a temple in 1875, which is believed to have been written 2,500 years ago and may have been based on even older writings. The texts described how mercury was used as a fuel for various devices, and the knowledge contained within the text is thought to have contributed to the German technological revolution of the early 20th century. Some sources say that the ancient text became the primary source of inspiration for all German military technology, and that the scientists who studied it were astounded by the accuracy and specification of the records. Going further, some even say that the pages contain designs and proposals for ancient aircraft, but that the scientists and engineers of the time simply weren't capable of taking the designs from the page and turning them into reality. The idea might not be as absurd as it sounds, though. We know that mercury has been used to create flying vehicles in the past at least once, and far earlier than anyone would imagine. The earliest example was in 1751, when a scientifically-minded monk named Andrea Grimaldi flew over the English Channel and landed in Dover, taking just over an hour and seven minutes. The device is said to have resembled a giant bird, and confirmation that the journey occurred exists in the form of letters, which are stored in both London and Italy. A study of the apparatus was performed in French Lyon and was signed by three academics. Many years later, in 1895, an unmanned mercury-based flying vehicle was demonstrated by Dr. Del Padre, who was the professor of the School of Art in Bombay. He took his inspiration directly from the pages of the ancient Indian text and created a device which flew up to 1,500 feet in the air before gently descending and returning to Earth. There were many witnesses to that event, including government officials. It wasn't a totally successful test, but demonstrated that the basic idea behind the Mercury engine worked. These successes were enough to make Germany firm believers in the potential of the Mercury engine, and many historians believe they were making significant progress towards turning it into workable reality during the Second World War. We all know how that ended, though. Hitler was defeated, and much German military equipment and research was destroyed, although all of the Allies curiously made significant scientific progress in the immediate aftermath of the war. What we still don't have today, though, 
are any high-tech devices which make use of these mysterious Mercury engines. Nor do we have any Mercury fuel generators, even though they clearly have a purpose and a practical benefit. The handling of Mercury is prohibited, and scientific use of it is severely restricted. Why might that be the case? Well, we don't want to contribute to any conspiracy theories, but if Mercury engines worked, all the companies who make fuel and gas for combustion engines would immediately be out of business, and the income of oil barons and oil trading nations would suddenly disappear. That's probably a good reason for rich people to pay to keep it under wraps. Have you heard any of these theories about Mercury before? Have you come into contact with Mercury and escaped unharmed? Let us know in the comments. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you soon.